Well, good morning, everyone. How are we doing? Great. Well, my name is Hugh, as been said. I'm one of the um, pastors here at Grace City Church. And um, yeah, I'm just so excited to be here this morning. I think it's going to be fantastic. So for you, perhaps this is your first time ever in a church kind of setting, or perhaps you, this is your first time in a long time, but we just want to say we're so pleased to have you with us today. It's so great to see you. We really are. So I hope that you have a good time. I hope that you feel at home with us. And I just really want to invite you in to kind of listen to what I'm going to say this morning. You may be wondering, hey, what, what is all this about? I don't really understand. Well, hopefully, I'm going to be able to explain it to you a little bit. So please do listen in. But I want to start by asking you a question I wonder what you think of when you think of Christianity, like kind of what first pops into your head. Something you think of is probably not fun, that probably doesn't come to your mind straight away, or perhaps um, enjoyable, relevant, true. Maybe these things aren't words that you associate with Christianity. A lot of people think that Christianity is just really dull. It's a lot of like super really uptight people who um, are intoxicatingly perfect in every single way, and actually they're really judgmental about people who do different things to them. They can be really annoying. Other people just feel like it's simply all untrue. It's just like science. We've got science now. Do we really need religion? Surely science is just putting an end to that kind of myth. We don't need to believe in that book that's just thousands of years old anymore. Other people, maybe it's not that it's untrue or true. You've never really thought about you never really thought about it. You just can't see a need for God in your life. You're kind of happy. Things are going okay. Why on earth would you need to look into Christianity? Actually, I discovered when I became a Christian, religion really isn't boring because God isn't boring. He's actually incredibly fun. And the more I looked at the claims of Christianity, the truth behind it, I was amazed how much reasonable rational evidence there is that Christianity really is the truth. It's so much more than just a myth. And perhaps if you think you just don't need it, I was amazed when I came to God, actually, this is not just a myth or a fairy tale. This is more than just a feeling. Actually, knowing Jesus is just the best thing about life. I can say that with all my heart. It's something that we all really need. So we need to take the time to answer, and that's what I'm going to look at today is, is there more to life than this? Is there more to life than this? And we're going to look at a few of the things that Jesus said about himself to answer this question. And firstly, one of the, the, one, the first thing is that Jesus said, I am the bread of life. I am the bread of life. And what he meant by that is that he is a kind of key ingredient to life, that if you haven't got him, you haven't really got life at all, which is a big statement to make about yourself. To try and explain this, um, uh, there, there was a Japanese person who told me that Japanese people, I don't know if you're here and you're Japanese, you can say whether well, this is true or not, but you, you kind of like got two stomachs. You've got a stomach on this side, which is for like um, the vegetables, soups, meats, and you kind of, kind of stuff like as much as you can possibly into this stomach, just keep stuffing it, stuffing it, but you never really feel full until you, you have rice, which goes in this stomach. And then once you have rice, it's like, I've had a meal now, I can feel full. Does that resonate with anyone? So you can just keep stuffing and stuffing and stuffing, but without kind of rice, you can never be full. That's how Jesus saw bread. It's like you can, you can have as much of life as you want. You can fill it with friends, you can fill it with fun, money, jobs, stuff, stuff, stuff. Jesus is saying, but without me, you're always going to feel a little bit empty. You're always going to feel like there's something missing. He was saying that he is the bread of life. And there's a number of people who, who, who would agree with him, even though they're not Christians necessarily. Some of them are, some of them aren't. So, for example, Prince Charles, he said, despite all the you know, advances of science and now we're civilized, we're developed, he said, there remains in the soul a persistent anxiety that something is missing. Some ingredient is missing that makes life worthwhile. Russell Brand, who's a famous comedian, uh, he said, drugs and alcohol are not my problem. Reality is my problem. Drugs and alcohol are my solution to fill the hole that's inside of me. He's saying, hey, I've got this, kind of, there's an emptiness, and I'm just trying to stuff it with stuff, and drugs and alcohol are what I use. Bernard Levin, who was a columnist, 
He was a, a columnist last century. He wrote an article titled Life's Great Riddle, and he says this, and I think it really hits home. He said, countries like ours are full of people who have all the material comforts they desire, together with such non-material blessings as a happy family. And yet they lead lives of desperation, understanding nothing but the fact there is a hole inside of them, and however much food and drink they pour into it, however many cars, TVs they stuff it with, however many well-balanced children and loyal friends they parade around the edges of it, this hole aches. This hole aches. Freddie Mercury, another um, famous person, great singer, shortly before his death in 1991, he admitted this. He said, you can have everything in the world and still be the loneliest man. That is the bitterest type of loneliness. He said, success has brought me world idolization and millions, but it's prevented me from having the one thing we all need, a loving, ongoing relationship. He's saying, listen, I've had absolutely everything, but I've never had this one thing, a loving, ongoing relationship. Obviously, he's not talking about God, but I think that that is the thing he's missing, a loving, ongoing relationship. And Jesus is saying he is the one to have that loving, ongoing relationship with. He's saying he is the bread of life. Without him, it's impossible to ever know true satisfaction. You may say, hey, okay, something of what you're saying is resonating with me. Sometimes I do have a kind of a little bit of an ache. Perhaps you are hungry. Perhaps you are searching for something deeper. I don't know. But how there's a bit of a jump to say, yeah, I've got an ache. Something's missing to saying... Jesus is the truth. Christianity is true. How do we make that leap? Let me point you to another thing that Jesus said. He said that he is the way, the truth, and the life. He's not a way. He's not one of many ways. He is the only way. He is the truth, and he, he is the life. Now, when I'm speaking to people... I've heard this a lot when I'm saying I'm a Christian and stuff. They go, oh, that's really nice. That's really nice for you. I'm glad that that's true for you. But it's not actually true for me. It's true for you, but it's not true for me. And um, I kind of feel like that doesn't really make sense. Because if something's true, it's either true or it's not. Like I can see there's some um, truth that is subjective, um, some that's a matter of opinion. So, for example, um, I'll make a bit of a confession. I wasn't expecting this to be said by me on a public platform. But it's true for me that The Bachelorette is a really enjoyable show. <laughs> I didn't, I just watched it for my wife, but then I actually started really enjoying it and I was embarrassed to admit it, but I'm, it's true for me that that's a good show. That might not be true for you. You may not feel the same, but that's okay, we can still be friends. That, that's just a matter of opinion, it's not a big thing. But what Jesus is saying it's like there's some truth that is either it's true or it's not true. There's no scale. It's true or it's not true. And what Jesus is saying, he is the truth. That's, that's either something that's true or not. C.S. Lewis, um, you may know, he was the one who created the Narnia Chronicles. He said this. He said, if Christianity is false, it's of no importance. If it's true, it's of infinite importance. The one thing it cannot be is moderately important. He's saying when, when you look at the claims of Jesus, you either say, hey, that's just not true at all. That's junk. I'll just throw that out. Or it's the most important thing you're ever going to hear in your life, and there's nothing more important. What it can't be is somewhere wishy-washy in the middle, true for me, but not true for you. It's either completely untrue, or it's the thing you need to hear above everything your ears will ever hear. And you need to be sure what you think about that. You need to know where you stand. You can't be somewhere in the middle. You know, I want you to be confident enough to say, actually, I've looked into it and I believe it's not true at all. Or I've looked into it and I think, actually, there's some truth in that. And we've got a course coming up as a church which serves just that purpose. It's like a kind of really relaxed, informal setting where on your own terms you get to explore the claims of Christianity and have a look for yourself to find out whether this is something worth listening to or where you can completely throw it out. 
And it's called Alpha. It's going to start this Wednesday night at 7 o'clock. And we have a nice meal together. We chat. And then there's a talk. And then you get to just kind of ask everything that's in your head. Just go, 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 go. And you can be as aggressive and cynical and say everything that you like. It's no problem. We're not going to preach at you. We're really just going to let you ask and explore. Because we're so confident in the claims of Christianity that they are absolutely true. So we're going to, you're going to hear a little bit more about that. I'll talk about it more again later. Because I'm convinced that it's true. And many other people in this room are convinced it's true. But there are many, many smarter people in the world who are also convinced it's true. Now, I know there's a lot of great minds who have looked at the evidence and decided it's not true. But actually, some of the greatest minds that have ever lived have explored the claims of Christianity and decided it, it must be true. For example, there's a professor uh, of history at Oxford University, and um, he... he any historian, serious historian, would, could not deny that Jesus lived, he was a person. You, you can't really argue anything else. The evidence is overwhelming. But this professor says, the resurrection of Jesus from the dead is the greatest fact, attested fact in history. Not just that he lived, but that he died and rose again is the greatest attested fact in history. Francis Collins, he's the leader of the Human Genome Project, He's one of the most respected genetic biologists in the entire world, like a huge brain. As an atheist, he came and explored the, the, the kind of truth behind Christianity, and he said as he looked at it, he was just totally convinced. It made so much sense to him, he just decided to follow. The guy who created the Alpha Course, Nicky Gumbel, he's a lawyer. Um, he, he, he's an atheist. He came to the Bible to disprove it, to show we've got a bird here. Yeah, you can just chill there. That would be really, really handy. Or we all just leave. You've got those two options. <laughs> Try not to move too much. Nicky Gumbel, as he explored Christianity, he said, I came to tear it apart. I came to show why it was false. And he said, the more I looked at it, the more I explored it. He said, even though I wanted to show how it was false, actually, it just so convinced me. He said, there was a ring of truth about everything that Jesus said and did. He said, reluctantly in the end, he became a Christian because he just, it was just the most logical thing to do because he was so convinced at the truth behind Christianity. And you need to know where you stand. You need to know what you think. Jesus also said that he is the life. He's the way, the truth, and the life. And you, know, you may be sitting here thinking, hey, it's not that... I think it's untrue or true. I've never really thought about it. You know, I'm kind of happy, but I just don't want to get involved. I just think the whole thing's just like a little bit irrelevant. I'm just, it's just not for me, okay? Like, you, good that you do it, but it's just not for me. And I, that resonates with me because I used to think exactly the same. Like, that, that was where I came from. I was um, brought up in a Christian home. My dad even led a church. So you could say, well, I was born to be a Christian. I had no choice. But I don't know if you can remember being a teenager if you are a teenager, if you've got teenagers, teenagers are wired to do the exact opposite of everything their parents say, even if it's sensible. So if you say to a teenager, hey, you need to do this, you're just going to do the opposite. So my parents are like, you need to go to church? I'm like, uh, no, just because I'm a teenager, that's what I'm going to do. And um, it wasn't that like I thought it was untrue or anything like that. I just, I just didn't really care. It just, it just was of no interest to me. And I was busy having lots of fun and... Um, they even made me go on whole week-long Christian camps where there were like three church meetings like this a day, every day. It's just like, oh, my goodness. Like, do I really have to go? But they were like, you know, we're going, so you have to go. You, you, I'm sure those kind of, uh, that resonates with you. And um, I was there having fun. Um, there were lots of quite uptight Christians who were really easy to wind up, and um, annoying them was like my personal hobby, and I enjoyed that aspect. But... Um, as I, as I was there, like, I, just, I just started to feel some sort of conviction in me, really. I, would, I just looked at them in their lives, and I just thought, the same as, as Kate, who shared about Amazing Grace, there was, they just seemed to really believe it. And um, in, in kind of meetings like this, I watched them worship, and some had their hands in the air, and they screwed up their face. And for, for me, there was just something, there was a sincerity about them. 
You know, this wasn't just hype. They believed it 100%. And I saw they had um, a peace and they had a joy that I didn't have. And I realized, although I thought I was the one having fun, they were the kind of the losers. Actually, it was like a switch. It was the other way around. They had something that brought them happiness and joy that I didn't have. And I was the one losing out. So there was a moment where I just decided... I, I, need, I just need to give this a try. And um, I went in a meeting and I put my hands in the air and I started to sing and nothing happened immediately. But over the next few days, I just, it's like I had, a, I had an encounter with God, if you like. He, he just came and showed me that he was really real and that everything that I'd learned was really true. And I just, I just needed to believe it. And um, it just came alive to me. And I, I suppose I, that point is the point when I would say I became a Christian at that point. I gave my life to Jesus and... In that moment, I've never felt like a joy like I felt in that moment up until that point. I never felt a peace like I felt in my life up to that point until then. It's like that kind of ache I described was just gone. Like I didn't need for, to search for anything anymore. It's just like I'd found what I was looking for in the person of Jesus Christ, in that loving, ongoing relationship with him. That was the moment that transformed my life. And if, if you wouldn't call yourself a Christian here today, you're not a regular churchgoer, I don't know where you are today, but I, I want to offer you the chance to respond to this message in two ways. The first way is I would in- encourage and challenge you to come and join us on the Alpha Course starting this Wednesday night. Um, there should be some information in your welcome pack if you've got one. Uh, there's plenty of flyers around. But it, as I said, it's just a really informal, great chance to really look into it and say yes or to say no. You know, you know, just to genuinely use logic, have a look, ask some questions, because it's a really big question I think you need to know the answer to. You know, is there more to life than this? What, what happens after we die? Where do we go? Are you, it's a great chance for you to explore that. And um, on your chairs, as you notice, you came in. There's a chocolate bar, there's a pen, there's um, a key communication card here. In a minute, we're all going to fill these out together, and I think the first box is saying that you want to you wanna join the Alpha course. So when we do that, just tick that and give, your, give us your details, and we'll let you know exactly when it's happening. But the second way, you know, I don't know where you are in your journey with Christ. I don't know if you've been looking at Christianity for some time now. I don't know, maybe this is the first time you're ever hearing this message. But maybe as I'm speaking, it something just kind of rings true. You think, yeah, that, that ache in my heart does resonate with me. That loving, ongoing relationship is what I need. I, wanna, I, I want that. I want to encounter Jesus. I'm going to give you a, a chance to, to make that decision even this morning. I'm going to pray a prayer soon. You can pray it after me and, and make a decision to follow Jesus. But before I do that, I just want to explain why Jesus is the way, the only way. When I came to God and became a Christian, you know, I came with a history. You know, I came with a past. I'd made mistakes. I've done things wrong. And you might feel exactly the same. You might feel actually like I haven't lived a perfect life. I've made some mistakes. And maybe there's even a degree of guilty in you. What do you think Jesus said to me when I came to him and said, hey, I want a, I want a loving, ongoing relationship with you? Do you think he said, firstly, it's great that you're here but actually, you're not quite good enough yet. Before you become a Christian, you need to make sure that you're a better person. So I'm going to put you on like a three-month probation period where you need to stop doing all that stuff. You need to make sure you go to church every week. And then once you've done that and you're good enough, then, then we can really begin to talk. And as silly as that sounds, I think that that's the way every other religion functions. It essentially says that God is up here and we're down here. And if we're good enough, then he'll accept us and we can be in relationship with him. He doesn't say that. He doesn't ask us to be perfect or good enough. But the other thing he doesn't say is, I know you've got a past. Hey, we'll just brush it under the carpet. Don't, don't worry about it. It's not a big deal. I know you've made some mistakes. We'll just pretend like that nothing ever happened. But he doesn't say that because when we, when we make mistakes, we often end up hurting other people. And if God loves people, how does he feel about the people that we hurt? It obviously upsets him. So he's got to do something about it. 
And this for me is where Christianity gets kind of really cool. Why Jesus is just the best person you'll ever encounter, better than any character ever invented. What he did is simply, he says, the way, the way you've lived, the mistakes you've made, they matter to me. No, they really matter to me. It's actually much more serious than you know. But then he also says, but you matter to me. You really matter to me. I love you so much more than you'll ever know. You are so special to me. So he made a decision instead of asking us to come up. He chose to come down to us. And he lived on earth as a man. And he never did anything wrong. Even his accusers couldn't find anything wrong with him. He wasn't guilty of anything. But he suffered and died an excruciating, barbaric death. And in that moment, he paid the price for every wrong thing, every mistake that I have ever made in my life and that you have ever made. He took the punishment himself. So it meant when I came to Christ on that day and said, hey, I want to come into a loving relationship with you. I, I believe you are the bread of life, but I've, I've got this past. I've made these mistakes. He said, yeah, I know. I've already paid the price for it. If you're sorry, then I totally, 100% forgive you of everything you've ever done wrong. And I came to him. And he said, the Bible describes us as blameless, spotless, perfect. Not because we've been good enough, not because of our performance, but because of everything that he's done, because of his performance. So in a minute, as I said, I'm, I'm, I'm going to pray a prayer. And I want everyone in the room, if you don't mind, just repeat it after me out loud. That would be great. But some of you, I just, I just want to encourage you to pray it for the first time. Actually, you're thinking, yeah, I've heard this before, but now's the time I need to commit. Or I've never heard this before, but there's just something going on in my heart. I just want to make that decision. I just want to follow Jesus. So if we could all close our eyes, that would be great. I'm going to pray, and if you could pray after me. Jesus, I believe you are the bread of life. I will never know satisfaction outside of you. I know I've done some wrong things. I've made some mistakes. I ask that you would totally forgive me. And I say that I'm truly sorry. But I believe because of what Jesus has done, you do forgive me. And I pray right now you would fill me with your love. That I would know just how special I am to you. In Jesus' name, amen.